Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, game designer and former intelligence officer Volko Runke on national security insights from board games. When physicists try to understand complex systems better, they model them. We could make greater use of all kinds of, of models, but including tabletop models, games, because games are all about examining interactions of actors and factors in a simplified, simulated setting. We can use these games to look in the past. We also can use them to look a little bit into the future. How might a conflict go and what can we test out and learn about that? We do want not to guarantee that the story goes exactly the same way as it did in history. That wouldn't be a game. We need plausible outputs for the player's inputs, historically plausible outcomes. Volko, thanks for talking to me today. Hi, David. Always great to chat with you. Sorry it's taken so long. I think I, I told you when we started Chatter, you you were one of the people on my short list of this is the kind of thing we want to be talking about where issues of national security intersect with some other field that people aren't as familiar with or it, it gives you a different perspective on things. And you are into gaming. But I think we need some taxonomy first, because okay. gaming brings up different ideas for different people, but there's definitely area. different ways of, of classifying what people will generally call games. So on the one end, gaming now, I think in popular conversation tends to mean the, the video gaming, right? The Fortnites and War, World of Warcraft and Call of Duty. But there's also traditional board games from the you know, no talent required shoots and ladders up through checkers and what monopoly and risk. And then there's historical war games and other historical simulations. And I think we're going to focus more on the latter, but talk through how you differentiate those. And when you talk about gaming and what you do, how do you separate it from those other areas? Yeah, it's a, a big question and a, and a lot to say. So my area of interest is is tabletop games, and many of those are board games, but that can mean card games or other manual things that you spread on the table. And so that's one sector, as you mentioned, of, of gaming, which is such a huge area. And then within that, there's a kind of a little corner of that board gaming hobby that's that, that the hobby has been growing uh, tremendously the, the last few decades and within that also growing is a, is a is a niche that you mentioned which is historical simulation games mm -hmm. and within that a large segment of that is conflict simulations consims uh c commonly known as war games so board war games that's where i spend the most of my time there are electronic versions of of some of those right there 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 are uh, absolutely so uh, and there's a variety there too some are simply um, um a means to reproduce playing the board game on your screen mm -hmm. where it doesn't enforce the rules or anything it's just a way that you can get on remotely with somebody and do the same thing you would do over a table you do on your screen and a lot of that is is free shareware just fan made and then there are also more professional ports of board games to become computer games with their own fancy user interface and typically a, uh, a an automated opponent that you can play against and you can also play online against other other folks and those are sold separately commercially such as on Steam. The advantage of video you already mentioned, which is you can interact with someone remotely, right? We can be in on different continents and a benefit from the experience. Uh, talk about the flip side. What's what's the benefit of in person huddled over a physical board playing with actual tokens in in tactile gaming yeah. over the virtual? So there are there are many. And on the hobby and fun side, I would venture if you ask most board gamers, just broadly, not historical gamers now, mm -hmm. you know, what's the most, the most fun thing about board games? What, what's the number one reason you do it? The answer is going to be social mm. interaction. Uh, that that a, a, a great thing about these games is actually physically sitting across the table from your friends and interacting with them through the game. And so, for example, 
we have uh, board game pubs and taverns, board game coffee shops and board game sandwich shops, you know, uh, that, that ha- have grown um, around the world because of this aspect that people just like getting together with their friends to do this activity. And of course, uh, same is true for, for families um, playing board games. But um, of more interest to me and it is what are the advantages for actually simulating something, learning something? What are the advantages of a board game over a computer game for time travel, you know, for visiting history, which is mm-hmm. the main fun I have with, with the games. And there, it's a, it, the issue is the accessibility. Uh, with, a, with a computer game, whatever the detail, I can't really look inside the box. I don't know the computer code. Mm-hmm. And it all comes down to the user interface, the interaction, to let me know why did something just happen. If it's a manual game, mm-hmm. I operate it myself. I'm pushing the pieces myself. I, I learn the rules. Now I've got complete access to the model, if you will, that's in the game with that fascinates me. And by operating it myself, I understand it more fully and I understand more fully how is it that the designer thinks history worked in this war or this country or this engagement? Or at least a simplified version of it as we'll, we'll talk Always about. a simplified yeah. version, but that's true yeah. of computer games too. Yep. Yeah. It would seem to me, um, someone who's dabbled in this, but is not deep in it, that there's also a benefit in person of the whoever's running the game being able to call an audible um, in a way that a computer game, it's it's harder, right? Because of the code being wired in in many ways. But if there's if there's something that's useful for the learners, if it's a learning environment or for the players, if it's purely entertainment, the the the, the person running the game can can change it on the fly and say, Hey, we want to do something fun. Well, guess what? You know, the clock just sped up or there are fewer turns or this just happened. And as long as you have agreement, that can be done. Whereas it seems like that's a little bit harder when it's in the code already. Absolutely. And that's, it's actually a larger benefit than that because everyone is running a board game. I mean, once I buy that board game, all I need is a pencil Hmm. and I can alter it to my tastes yeah. uh, or I can experiment in that way. And so it's actually a very small step relative to computer games to go from playing the rules you've been given to tweaking and improving them and Mm -hmm. in in effect starting to design games. And that is hugely, hugely powerful for exploration and understanding Mm -hmm. and fun. We're talking in a very abstract way so far, but I want to get a little bit more tactical by talking about some of your games that that you've developed. Um, but before that, I want to talk about how the games intersected with your career, uh, which we'll, we'll probably come back to in more depth later. But just to briefly tee up why we're talking about this in the national <laughs> right. security context, um, talk a little bit about your your career in, in the U.S. government and how gaming did or didn't intersect with it uh, across those years. So I was a uh, CIA analyst for uh, about three decades and uh, covering various topics. And about the last third of that, um, as you know, I was an instructor at the Kent School, which is the agency's uh, analytic training establishment. And so in that, I was teaching other analysts um, how to uh, do their jobs better. And we used... Uh, many different tools in the classroom, as, as you know, and games and tabletop simulations specifically were one of them. So, and, and it's, it's a long story, but then the, the nub of it is that everything for me came together in terms of why I thought board games were so interesting to explore mm-hmm. history and what we needed to have to do our jobs better as analysts and, and the role that games and game design played in, in uh, solving that assignment. But the and, history came first, if I recall, right? And we're going back to uh, slightly younger Volko in, in college. Right, uh, right. What wasn't, wasn't history a, a passion of yours that ended up d- leading to this career in the first place? Uh, it, it was. So I have been playing a historical game since sixth grade. And 
And that led that actually playing the games led to interest in history and then international relations and uh, a graduate degree in foreign service and interest in working in the intelligence community. So that's all uh, one for me interwoven mm -hmm. um, trajectory. And absolutely, we can use these games to look in the past or, or, and understand human systems as they were. Certainly, we also can use them. And if there's a whole industry in uh, the US Department of Defense, for example, that does mm -hmm. that to look uh, a little bit into the future, how might a conflict go and what would, can we test out and learn about that? Here's a memory test for you. Do you remember that first game you played? Oh, absolutely. Fran France 1940. I, I remember it. I, wow. I remember it. and It's still a, a treasured uh, relic on my shelf. Yeah. Uh, about how many games do you physically own at this point? Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's um, scores upon scores, but I will say I have <laughs> gone through culls, and I went through a, a big cull at one point where I was like, I'm going to go through this closet, and if there's anything that I wouldn't recommend mm. to somebody mm. uh, at a minimum and play myself, but but even if it's just one I wouldn't in good conscience recommend or sell to somebody, I'm just going to throw it away. So I, I threw them all in the dumpster, but then one of our colleagues heard I did that that day and said, no, I'll take them. And so we all, we actually, after work, drove home and he pulled them all out of, out of our, my trash bin and took <laughs> That's them. That's a close so, call. Yeah. So I don't have as many as I did, um, but, but it's a lot. Now I've never, I've, I've never like cataloged or counted them. Right. You don't need to probably because you, you, you have a good sense of what you have. And if you have an urge to do something yeah. that's you know, ancient history versus medieval history versus modern, you probably know what's there, right? I, I, I do. And uh, it's kind of like those of us who have a lot of books, you know, and we're like, I know I have that book and now I can't find it. And I, it's just like with the books, I lend them out to, to people. And then I forget yep. who, who I've lent them to and where they've ended up. Yeah. I, I know that feeling very well because just this last week I was looking for a book that I know I had for decades. And I assumed I still had, and I have a vague recollection of lending it to somebody years ago, but I, I I'm not sure about that, but it's gone. So yeah. I think somebody else is still enjoying a book many years later. Do you know how many books you have? I have not counted. I could do a rough calculation by shelf space and, and average, but, uh, each year we, we do a cull yeah. of our books and donate usually around a hundred or 200 to, yeah. Um, either the, you know, a local charity or, you know, a library or a center or somewhere that can, can use them um, because we're just avid readers and we're always bringing more in. Um, but it gets more difficult each year because except for the new ones you've brought in that you know you're not going to do again because you've just seen them, the other ones survived all the earlier cuts, which means they're, they're not the low-hanging fruit anymore. So each year it has become more difficult and we've just found we've had to expand the bookshelves. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the games that you have developed, and don't worry, I want to come back to a lot of the things you just raised about the training environment where, uh, disclosure, we, we work together and I had the opportunity to see you do some gaming in the training environment for the government. And I believe you came to a class that I was running where I incorporated a game designed by someone else. But I want to talk about the things you've developed that are available out there and, and what each one of them tells us about the act of gaming and whether it's something that's used to teach others or whether it's used to learn from the play itself. I think the first one you did was the, the wilderness war. Is that right? That's the first complete game that I had yeah. published. That's right. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit and just basically what, what is the setting? What is the context? And then what is the gameplay experience for people who choose to jump in? Sure. Uh, Wilderness War uh, from GMT Games is about the French and Indian War. Uh, so it's 1755 to 1760s. And it's a two-player game uh, in which the French and the British are fighting their war with Indian allies and provincials and regulars. And it's essentially an operational uh, maneuver game. Uh, and it's in a genre of design of uh, uh, war game design called card driven games, and uh, that means that there's a there's a map and pieces that move across the map, but there also uh, is a deck of cards, and you get dealt a hand of cards, and those cards 
act, enable you to do whatever you're going to do. And the, um, the, the wonderful thing about these kinds of cards is that they very uh, readily um, uh, bring in all kinds of events. So a lot of games are focused on one discipline, a military game, a war game. But sure. of course, politics, economics, culture, society, so many things are interrelated. Yeah. I mean, these things are all interwoven and that's true in, in war as it is in, 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 in peace and daily life. And so these card-driven games will, instead of having a ton of rules exceptions to say, okay, yeah, you could do that, but because of the treaty of such and such, you can't, or the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. um, the card comes up and it tells you right on that card what the rule is that can bring in anything you like, mm -hmm. you know, weather, uh, pol political events, um, d diplomacy, and so on. So if I understand it right, the cards, the way you've just described them, are used to um, kind of round out the actual core gameplay. Um, but I recently played a game where there were, okay, first of all, I think there were hundreds of cards available, um, but each team got to select only a few from probably the hundred cards available. And it wasn't the number of cards, it was the number of points on the cards, but you get the idea. You, you, you only got to have a few of these, but it was absolutely overwhelming the military options that were available in all of these cards. Yeah. And yet, I'm, I'd have to do a count, but I'm guessing well over 95% of the cards weren't used in in the game because you just simply didn't have the points to have that many things. So in that case, it wasn't necessarily to bring in social, political, meteorological, you know, spiritual elements. The cards <laughs> were, were a core part of the game, but you had to choose at the beginning, here is what you're going to use, and you barely have time to even see all of the options out there. Um, talk about that choice as a developer. Like, how do you decide how you're going to have enough cards to make it interesting, but you're not going to have so many cards that a user can't possibly get through all of them, even in multiple gameplays? Yeah. So there, there, there's there's two aspects that that you're touching on here in, in game design. Uh, one is um, gameplay, and and uh, and one is simulation when we're talking about war games. So for, for simulation, um, and in, in either case, by the way, the difference here is agency, player agency, right? There's a deck of cards. There's all kinds of things in them. As the player, how much agency do I have to choose? I want that card to come up now versus I receive that card and it happens to me, or maybe something in between, like in Wilderness War, where these cards are dealt to me. I have a hand out of the 70 total cards. I'm holding nine of them. I didn't have agency in choosing those nine, but now I can choose the order and which to play how because each card offers several choices how you might use it in that game. Okay, so for simulation, how much agency do you think the actors, the historical actors that you are representing with the player really had, right? Some things, I mean, if I'm, you know, if I'm Napoleon or whatever, or I'm a a corporal in a World War II infantry unit, whatever it is, whatever, whoever I'm supposed to represent as the player, there are a number of things I can decide and choose from. And there are a number of things that they just happen to me, you know, and, and that um, external random factor, okay, we can represent by having a card dealt to you. Whereas if what's key is the actor who has agency in the system can do things that affect what happens in the world, then we give a choice. And so we can go all the way, one way or another way in terms of are these, is this a menu system? You know, uh, is, the, is the card deck as in the game you described like a supermarket? As a player, I can go into that deck, I can shovel through it, I can pluck out this one. And I've done that in some of my designs or it's, you know, in other of my designs, it's not even that I get dealt a hand of cards. The top card flips up and every, all players have to react to that and that's it. That's what you've got. That's the opportunity right now. You know, do do what you will with it. And we're reacting to that. Now, for gameplay, there are pluses and minuses to each of those. Generally, we want to have agency for fun and interesting games. We want to be making decisions that affect things. You mentioned s snakes and ladders or shoots and ladders. There's no agency. I, I roll the die. I move my piece. Good things happen to me. Bad things happen to me. Okay, 
not too much fun for very long. On the other hand, we might have for gameplay too much agency. As you described, if you get with, if you tell the player, you can do any of these 20 things or choose any of these 100 cards, go. I call that menu shock. Uh, that is, uh, eventually I could learn this game and play it reasonably. I didn't have a name for what I experienced, but that's exactly what it felt yeah. like, is I was overwhelmed by the options and I'm like, fuck it. Like, I can't, I can't choose, so I'm just going to take right. the top seven because... It would take me two hours to actually rationally consider all of the options. Right. And where that sweet spot is between lots of agency and little agency is a matter of, of taste. Yeah. What kind of game are you looking for? Or for simulation, how, right. what, what is your model of, of how much agency the real world actors really had? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it, and I just made it sound negative by being you know so overwhelmed, but it actually was a positive after the game because going through the cards, looking at the options and realizing, oh, there were some really interesting things here that th it was a game that would be rewarded by multiple plays. And yes. you could see very different ways of scenarios building depending on the the deck you built, you built essentially from, yeah. from the options. And we call that replay value yeah. in the game design. And that's very much a positive, right? Yeah, get people back in, right? So it's not right. the same dynamic every time. Yeah. But the bigger issue you point to, Volko, is... is is one that a lot of people struggle with in other contexts, which is this, this issue of agency and relatedly um, the issue of control of events. Because, because something historically happened a certain way, we, we think that either it had to happen that way or it was highly probable to happen in the way that it did. When in fact, sometimes there were some very low probability contingencies that happened. Um, and when we see that portrayed in fiction, Sometimes we, you know, it, it rubs us the wrong way. And I'm thinking here of something like Game of Thrones, where there were some, you know, very important characters that were killed off rather unceremoniously, or just something very strange happens out of the blue from the weather or something else. And it seems like, really, you know, why can't it be a more traditional story? And then you realize, no, he was very historically minded. And he realized there are plenty of cases where people just randomly died. Someone falls off a horse and dies. And it doesn't play out the way that the person who wants to be pulling all the strings perfectly wants it to. And as a game designer, you, you probably want to bring in some of that to, in a sense, give it that more realistic historical flavor, even if some players get frustrated that, uh-oh, it's a roll of the dice and I just got hit by lightning and died. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So a very quick story because I'm right now I've, I'm working on a game called Hunt for Blackbeard. Uh, so the, the, the historical Ooh. pirate Hunt for Blackbeard that ended sure. in a battle in, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. in that battle, the pirate hunters, they didn't even have cannon. They're, they're firing muskets. And in the battle, we know that one of Blackbeard's ship's sails was cut down because the rope was cut which means by a musket ball hitting the rope. Whoa. And because of that, Blackbeard could not get away, turned around, attacked the, the, the Royal Navy ships and lost the battle and died. So it was a decisive outcome. So if we're going to simulate that, I mean, chance, freak chance even, absolutely has to play a role. Otherwise, it's just not going to be realistic. And this points to what I think is, is such a power of these games, whether we're looking at history or we're looking at, uh, you know, future wars mm -hmm. uh, or current uh, diplomatic contests or parliamentary politics or anything you might want to explore that's complex. And that is when we read a history book or we watch a movie, it is a narrative. This thing happened, then this thing happened, right. this thing happened, right? And we tend, therefore, to think of it as that way, as if it was all preset at the time. Yeah. When it's never like that at the time, it's always the case that, well, there are all kinds of wild things that could happen that a commander or a politician ha has to try to account for and then navigate. And some of those things that happen are really, really wild and wacky, you know, at the far end, at the tail of the curve, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so when we design a game, we're going to explore all that, but we very um, consciously have to decide what is the scope of that variance from the historical narrative? Or if we're talking about the near future, the expected narrative that, common, yeah. that we hold, right? How wacky are we going to allow the play to be? That's a design decision and a critical one. How important is it to be historically accurate. Now, I don't mean in terms of 
you know, geography, right? North Carolina it has its coastline in the years that you're looking at the way that it did, or the shape of North America is this. I don't, that's, you want that to be accurate, but accurate in terms of wanting the game or enabling the game to play out the way that history actually ended up. Is that ever the goal of a game or do you want that as an option, but something that can go in a very different direction as needed? Sort of. <laughs> um, so what you would, it, it depends on what you're after, but here's what I'm after in, in, in my games. Uh, and when I play uh, historical games, I want to give or gain insight into how things worked for the participants at the time as best I can. So how things worked means some things have to be grounded in what we know was reality, but it also means we have to allow for that variance in the narrative that I talked about. Because the, at the time, how it worked was people didn't know how it was going to play out, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we do that? And again, that is absolutely a, an individual judgment call each time that you're deciding as a designer, I'm going to hold these things constant. I'm going to hold the geography of North Carolina constant, um, even though actually it's changed a lot over time and there are inlets then that there are not now and we don't even completely know, you know, but anyway. Um, and other things I'm going to allow to vary. That's a part of the design that, that may be invisible, but is really important. And just I'll just even illustrate this. It's not the case that we always want the geography to be what it really was. So there's a great game um, called Conquest of Paradise, and it's about the Polynesian expansion um, 700 to 1500 AD. I mean, it's just a, a, a massive, um, technologically adept exploration and colonization of a vast area of the planet, uh, Poly Polynesia. And the game is about that. And when you play the game, the way it works is you start off at your home um, island group and you send explorers out to go discover islands. And what happens, these explorers, if they're successful, will place a tile on the map that's drawn randomly. And the tile might have a large island like Hawaii, or it might have a, oh. a small atoll. Um, it might be, uh, or it might be New Zealand, you know, uh, or Easter Island or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so as you go, you can see you're semi-randomly recreating a new map of the Pacific. Well, how is that realistic? You could have New Zealand where there's Hawaii. Well, not exactly, but you can have Hawaii where there's Easter right. Island and so forth. Well, because that's the uncertainty that's facing the explorers at the time. Right. And what's important, what's consequent is what was it like to sail out into an, uh, an ocean that you knew nothing about, hoping to find a place you could, could then settle. That's the, the essence of the experience that the game so, uh, so well reproduces. And that, that definitely to me as a, as an amateur here seems to make sense for that scenario, right? Cause it is about the exploration, the unknown. It's not about, um, something like one of your world war II tactical scenarios. What was it? Combat commander, right? Where you mm -hmm. have a very set mission and it's, it's much more of a, a tactical thing with rules of the battlefield. Different types of games can, can have different variables there, right? That, that, that's right. And so I don't want to, uh, let, let me talk about the other side of it though. I don't want to imply that, oh, just anything can happen and it's fine. You know, I mean, we can't allow you if it's, uh, you know, if it's Polynesia in a thousand AD, you can't fly to the moon. That wouldn't be a historical simulation, right? Good point. And so what we, we are looking for historicity. Mm -hmm. In fact, every game mechanic, every kind of decision of what's in the game has to justify itself for gameplay, has to have some purpose to enhance the play of the game, make that interesting and, 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 and enjoyable, and to simulate whatever the topic is, if it's a simulation game, like a, a historical war game. And so we do want not to guarantee that the story goes exactly the same way as it did in history. That wouldn't be a game. You know, right. that's, just a, that's just a story. Yeah. But... We do want it to be possible mm -hmm. when playing the game reasonably for it to reproduce historical results. We, mm. need, we need plausible outputs for the player's inputs, historically yeah. plausible outcomes. 
What bias have you seen, if any, among uh, either new historical gamers or more experienced ones in terms of that, that knowledge of how things did turn out? For example, if there's a game about, you know, where are the allies going to invade on D-Day? Everyone playing the game should know it, it, it was Normandy. But of course, you know that the other side knows that it was Normandy. Um, for some other less well-known historical games, there's probably a difference in knowledge of people knowing exactly how the Plantagenets did this in the War of the Roses or, or whatever the, the case may be. Um, how have you found that? Do you think that that is a bias where people go towards the solution that they think is what happened because there must have been some benefit because it happened that way? Or people want to try something different just to mess with the other side or to get a better experience of play? Yeah, this is the challenge of uh, in historical games of player hindsight. And it, it can be difficult to deal with, and we end up doing all kinds of little design tricks. Uh, you know, you mentioned D-Day. Uh, I, I had mentioned France 1940 as my, my first war game. And, and that particular campaign, which is, you know, much, much studied, of course, because it's such a uh, spectacular uh, failure on the part of what seemed to be a materially equal or even stronger Western alliance um, defeated by the Germans. Well, the Germans uh, pulled off a, a, a trick that the Allies weren't expecting. They moved their mobile units through the dense Ardennes forest where the French were not expecting them. And so if you play that as two players, the, the game design, and there are many designs who have taken different solutions to this, has to somehow accommodate that. And one way that's you know not very satisfying is uh, called an Iron Maiden rule. That is, I'm just simply going to force you as the French to march into Belgium as if you didn't know the Germans could move their tanks through the Ardennes, and then we're going to play it out. Um, uh, it, but that, it just shows you, yeah, this is a hard problem to deal with. And I've bumped into something else less well known, but it's related to that, um, that I don't, that there's probably not a, 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 a um, perfect solution for. And it, it comes up very strongly in a game I did about the war on terror called, called Labyrinth. Um, and that is, what do you do if you are, if players are representing historical actors and those actors behave on the basis of some understanding of the world or of each other? that we now think is false. How do we get the players to realistically represent with their agency, represent these actors? Because we either have to force them to act on the basis of things that don't work in the model of the game, or we have to have the model of the game reward such historical decisions with benefits that we might now today think are not realistic. Hmm. And so in Labyrinth, the, the challenge was I'm representing the, you know, the, the, the game is concerns the years 2001 to 2010 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And it's global scale. And one player is the US and, and US allies in, in counterterrorism. And the other side is jihadists like oh. Al Qaeda and others. And so each of those um, actors, if we boil those two sides down into, you know, a single player representing them, each of those actors had a strategy. Right. And that strategy was based on certain premises mm -hmm. about the world and about the, uh, the the opponent, the enemy, and how the enemy would react to what. And so how to design the game where the U.S. will act like the U.S. did in, in those times. And it makes sense from a gameplay perspective. Mm -hmm. And Al-Qaeda and the others pursue the strategy they did at that time. And it makes sense. You can win as Al-Qaeda pursuing Al-Qaeda's strategy. How, how, to, how to do that in a game? So I had my solution. It was a, was a rough one. But, but that's a similar kind of thing, that there just are ways that because we are trying through a tabletop manual model to transport you through time, you know, mm -hmm. to inhabit a different actor's mind and body, there are just problems that are very difficult to overcome that will always leave a gap between, uh, you know, play and realism. And that gets to a, a bigger issue here about the games that it seems to me there's a fundamentally different purpose. If you're thinking about the game as a way of teaching something about a particular time, 
Um, that is to help people to understand the wilderness war or to help people understand the global war on terror at the time, or whether the goal of the game is to actually learn something uh, about it from, from the play. Um, I didn't articulate that well, but I think you understand whether, whether the goal is to learn history or whether the goal is to actually apply something to history. Um, I guess that's probably in the, that's gotta be in the game designer's head early on, right? Whether this will be played primarily as, oh, this is fun. We like learning details about the civil war. And this is going to be a game that has incredible detail about every Confederate sailing vessel that was available. And so it's a learning opportunity versus whether it's a chance to um, actually do something quite different and just use the game as that opportunity. Well, yeah, it that should not only be in the designer's uh, mind, it should be at the heart of the whole enterprise uh, of designing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, to make a comparison for you, we spent a lot of time in intelligence analysis focused on intelligence questions and the idea of honing that question. And if we don't get that question right, right. we're probably not going to deliver a product that, that the answers are going to be worth worth too much. And it's the same thing here. Uh, if you're designing a game, what's its purpose? You know, who's your who's your audience, and what are you trying to do for them? It's, 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 or if you're writing an essay, you know, or you're producing a podcast, who's your audience, and what is it you're trying to deliver? That mm -hmm. should be at the the heart of the conception, and so at the heart of game design. And what I found particularly unifying, I guess, in my life between career and hobby, um, is. Uh, is the, the definition we, we used um, in our classroom for, mm -hmm. for model. What is a model, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we used, it's a purposeful simplification. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's always a simplification, just like any war game is a simplification of reality. Mm -hmm. Has to be. And it is a simplification that is done in such a way to be useful, mm. right? It's not completely right, but we have simplified to a purpose. We've taken out details. We've bounded what can happen. We've limited agency and so forth, all to do what? To explore some topic, some aspect of some topic, to teach, to teach something about something. And we always will focus on some aspects of a historical setting and, and cast away others hmm. because it's a model. Yeah. Now think about a history book. The entire affair of professionally studying history and trying to illuminate how did things work, there's always a focus. There's always simplification. There's mm -hmm. always a purpose to every research project, every book, every lecture, and games are no different. Hmm. Imposing order on complexity is the way that my graduate uh, professor, Peter Fever, put it. Um, so... Applying this to a couple of your other games, Volko, I, I think about there are some things like uh, Vietnam that are in your uh, counter insurgency series, the coin series that you did, which had a game on the FARC rebels in Colombia and you had a game, you did a Philippines one, right? Actually, a, uh, it's in the same series by another designer, Ken okay. T. Okay. Philippines, uh, People Power just now delivered actually. Okay. And then Fire in the Lake. Uh, the Vietnam one, a lot of those, at least some people who have worked in, you know, counterterrorism or counterinsurgency are familiar with it. And I think they're, at least for me, that would be one that I would play kind of, okay, let's see how I can mess with things. Let's see how history could go differently. Mm -hmm. Whereas you've done a couple of games, um, Nevsky uh, is one. And then you did, I think it was called Falling Sky about the revolt against Caesar in Gaul, yes. where honestly, if I'm playing that game, I'm like a kid in a candy store just trying to learn, right? I don't I don't want to mess with what happened because I don't know the precise details of what happened. And I'm just fascinated by the places, by the people, by the events. Um, how do you gauge when you're actually designing a game? Do you, do you spend time thinking about what percentage of the game buying public <laughs> is going to treat it one way or the other? Uh, I certainly spend time thinking about it. Uh, in the end, it's uh, in the end there are several audiences for every 
uh, product, if you will. And some of those audiences are coming to the game because they like to play this kind of game and the topic isn't that much of interest to them anyway. And hopefully once they play the game, they get more interested in the topic and maybe even, and this happens a lot, it certainly happens to me when I play, they start reading books about that setting sure. uh, that they weren't interested in until they played the game. <laughs> but on the other side of it, it doesn't matter what the topic is. I guarantee you there are people out there who are enthusiasts and are deeper into it than I ever could be. And I have to have them in mind as well. So I am really trying to you know, get, get the history right as much as, as I can, because these issues it doesn't matter if it's 13th century Russia or, or 1960s Vietnam, that these issues are, are important to people. Uh, and so to be, to be respectful of that and to, um, you know, and to, uh, get them to enjoy the game and buy the model <laughs> that I'm putting out there, <laughs> I, I put a lot of care into getting it, getting it right for, for the specialists while trying to also make it accessible to non-specialists and, and a, and a fantastic way <laughs> that, um, I have discovered over my hobby career to mm -hmm. do that is collaboration is the fact that you can find these enthusiasts mm. anywhere now through through social media especially and and they will help you uh they will help you get it right and so as i've gone on design i have just made it a, a point of making it a more and more open process each project mm -hmm. with i think better results uh, in terms of um, reaching and respecting all audiences. Sure. There's a couple of threads there that, that I want to pull on. First is the latter point about the, the, the social media and the collaborative nature of this. Maybe I've just been in the wrong places with the wrong people, but every experience I have had with, with game designers, with game players has been incredibly supportive and and patience and a very much of a, a listening culture and you don't have the same kind of dominating personality traits that you often see played out in other contexts of social interaction maybe again maybe i'm in the wrong places and there are a bunch <laughs> of assholes who play games and you have to rough them up but i i'm amazed and even in the stuff i've seen you and uh, sebastian and others put out on on twitter it, it always looks like a very collaborative, supportive endeavor. And I'm wondering if that is a function of kind of a self-selection is if I choose that I'm going to play this kind of game, I'm probably not the, the bull in the China shop kind of person, or whether there is something about the nature of the gameplay that mellows people out enough on that side of things, even if they're immensely and intensely interested in the actual game itself. What do you think about that? Why is it that this community seems so supportive and collaborative when so many other human endeavors are not? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. You, uh, I do think there are all there are all types and of uh, folks, and as in any other community, and and it's possible that you got lucky, and and, <laughs> and it's possible that um, the those who you ended up finding are the ones who wanted to be found in in that way. I, I'm not sure. I will say that it's easiest to be successful designing, developing, testing, promoting, and playing games the more open you are in this day and age of communications. I mean, the idea of yeah. some isolated genius sitting in a basement somewhere and and then cooking up some brilliant something and then puts it out to the world and you know, never does interviews. I mean, that's just an old, outdated, it can happen. Mm. But the, your chances of success when you're trying to, after all, we know that diverse cognition helps us understand complex systems. And that's mm -hmm. what you're doing when you design mm -hmm. a simulation game. So being open to lots of folks coming in and messing with what you're doing, it just, it just is more effective. I mean, it, it, there's no, there's no question. However, uh, I think like any other culture or any other community or society, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. the deeper you were to probe, the more you would discover that under the surface, there is a lot of, um, well, the opposite of openness. There's, 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 there's bad blood. There's tempests and teapots all over the place. Mm. Uh, Lots of cases where you would just shake your head and say, well, I understand that the passions are so high because the stakes are so low. I mean, you know, at the end, sometimes I, I do see conversations in which I have to say to myself, um, you know, come on folks, these are games. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, I, you're right. Maybe I've, I've, I've just been in the wrong rooms, but I'll, I'll describe a few experiences here and it, and this will end up getting to that second thread, which is you, you mentioned this as your hobby career, but, but this will tie back into what you considered, uh, your non hobby career. My experience with the gaming is that people who I did know before they were playing a game, even if only briefly, um, universally in my, in, in my experience, people were either the same or they were more mellow, thoughtful, uh, more listening, more respectful in the game. Um, it was never the opposite. And this came about in some training scenarios in which I, I led a, a class in a training environment and we incorporated a game. And over the course of a few days or a week, I would notice there were some personalities who were a little more boisterous or even aggressive. But during the gameplay, they didn't come in and, you know, flip the board or even, you know, try to make their way in the team in the same way. Something about it mellowed their personality a, a bit. Um, and frankly, even with you, uh, having worked with you decades ago, you know, when you have an opinion, um, you express it. You're not shy about that. You, you back it up with logic and argumentation and facts. You, you, you were very good at that then. You're very good at that now. But in an analytic coordination or in a briefing context, you, you were not a wallflower. You, you were able to put your opinion out there forcefully, might have the wrong connotation, but vigorously. And yet when I see you step into the gameplay, um, I see you almost holding back and trying to make sure that you're not, not bullying, that's too strong a word, but you're not overly influencing others, that you're trying to be helpful and bring people along even more than, than as an analyst or a manager. Um, so I've seen it in those contexts where I, I have some sense of a person's personality. And in, in both of those cases, it seemed to me that something about, maybe it's just about the fact that it is a board game and we're choosing to have fun with it. And the stakes are lower, as you said, um, maybe it's the opportunity to learn from other people, but it seems to me that it, it may not bring out the best in people, but it doesn't bring out the worst in people the way that some other things like sports, uh, occasionally can. Yeah, I you know if it's a um, a simulation game of some some kind, uh, it's role play, and and we know that role play can be therapeutic. It can bring out truths that underlie that don't come out just in ordinary conversation. It can license us to be different than we otherwise would be. And so I think I think uh, you know tabletop gameplay does does the same thing. It may bring out competition that otherwise wouldn't be there. It may bring out shyness because I don't want to, in front of my peers, look incompetent at losing this game. And so I'm more hesitant that, mm-hmm. that you can see that, uh, that effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can, it can give us license to interact. Mm-hmm. So introverted people, they might not be as eager to interact, but Typically, when there's an agenda that they believe in, they interact quite vigorously. And so I've seen that in the classroom uh, with analysts, not just playing games. Uh, we do we did um, a technique in which students would stage like a little skit mm-hmm. based on um, real world groups, you know, and they're like portraying. Mm-hmm. you know, real life groups and characters. And they and you would get them to do things in these skits and to give you insights actually in these skits um, that would be hard to, you know, just to get them to, to tell you about in regular conversation. I will say though, that I have seen how different cultures of mm. students play games mm. differs also. 
So some of the, the player's character remains. Um, there was one game that I had, that I had co-designed for a course and played many, many, many times with, with uh, civilian intelligence analysts. Mm -hmm. And on um, one occasion, we took it to a uh, US Marine Corps unit and we played it one day with Marine Corps enlisted and another day with Marine Corps officers. And the way these Marines played that game was very, very different huh. than the way the okay. civilian analysts had played the game. And, and in fact, the enlisted and the officers, the only difference was the enlisted all chewed tobacco and none of the officers did. But other than that, their behavior, <laughs> and it was hyper competitive. It was, right. I mean, they were so focused on not allowing the other team any potential edge or even to cheat, mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. and it, I mean, it's a training game, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it had to do something with that to do something with the, the culture from which those players came. That it, that is interesting. So I, yeah, I guess it, you've had wider experience with it. You mentioned the, the military, um, in this case, the Marine Corps, the military, probably more than most other segments of the U.S. government and maybe U.S. overall has had a longer experience with wargaming and doing a lot of these things. Now, some of them are, are tabletop simulations, some of them actual board games. Um, what lessons have you learned from that community and your design of games and your application of it to things like intelligence officers instead of actual military scenarios? Uh, well, a, a lot. And to a degree, the way that the intelligence community uses games, not just for training, but for research and analysis draws, I think, heavily from the longer tradition of doing that within the, the, the Department of Defense and the services. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, there's a um, series of, of conferences that, that I um, have attended many of called Connections. Um, and they, they've spread from DC to the current Canada, UK, Netherlands. And the whole purpose of these um, conferences is to bring together mostly defense related professional war gamers with uh, hobby uh, gamers and game designers uh, like, like me so that we can, um, so that we can cross pollinate. And so having drawn um, experience from from that community, I think, did help me a lot in terms of, you know, how do we apply this in the in the classroom for intelligence analysts as opposed to for military practitioners or for hobbyists. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier a, a phrase that I don't want to let go. You mentioned complex systems, which to me describes almost everything that, as an intelligence analyst, I looked at. Nothing was a, a simple closed, you know, flip switch option. There were always competing resources, competing demands, competing power centers, uh, internal factors, external factors for basically anything I ever analyzed or managed analysts looking at or briefed. Um, it seems to me that gaming is particularly well suited to help people understand complex systems um, in a way that's away from them sitting and looking at a computer screen for eight hours and reading intelligence traffic because you're in the complexity then and you're not taking that step back to look at it, at least not as consciously and not in as organized a way. Talk through that a little bit. How did you see, especially when you were working in the, the training of intelligence, um, how did you see that playing out in real time with helping analysts to understand both the complexity of systems, but then also the ability of actors that they were analyzing to operate in complex systems? Yeah. Well, I, it, yeah, vividly, uh, <laughs> is, is, is how I, I saw it. I, you're, you're exactly right. And, and what I mean here by, by complexity and complex systems is in the, in the formal sense, in the mathematical sense, complex adaptive systems, meaning the, the interactions of many actors and factors, actors with agency, the interactions themselves creating a nature of the whole that is fundamentally different than any of its parts. So when we think about any human enterprise, war is one, politics is another, economics is another. This, is, this occurs in natural systems also, but, but human systems being what we're interested in mainly as historians or as intelligence officers. Uh, 
as you said, there are complex adaptive systems everywhere, and they are extremely difficult to understand and forecast and therefore navigate if you're a politician or a military commander, because the nature of the system can change very dramatically, right? It's, it's small inputs produce big outputs. They're nonlinear, right? right. That's right. complexity. Okay. Yeah. So, and I, you may recall this, that, that once in the intelligence community, we had adopted a variety of analytic procedures, structured analytic techniques and so forth, right? Um, we bumped into this issue of complexity, Right, and it was it was a it was a it was a kind of a a, a a tradecraft challenge for us, because analytic techniques that that we had were were ju- just that analytic in the formal sense. They were about taking things apart, right? And we're going to look at this hypothesis and this datum and this yep. piece of evidence and yep. so forth. Um, that's analysis, and it's how we structured ourselves. We broke the world up into tiny tiny fragments, and each junior analyst got one fragment, right? And we discovered, of course, that we were facing challenges because that's not how the world works. The interaction of things to create the whole, right, complexity, that's what makes big things happen. You know, in the the context of things like the Arab Awakening, we really realized you could have a very small event in one country, you know, result in political revolutions and and wars across, across a region, right? So how do we help policymakers navigate that? And when we looked at that, Right, we said. Well, first, we have to get our analysts familiar with what are what is a complex sys- adaptive system. How can we get them used to thinking about actors, factors, and their interactions to understand their topic of study? And then, what? Right? What tools? What procedures right. can we give them mm-hmm. to help them take on that complexity more effectively? And the answer we came up with was one thing. Models. Mm-hmm. You know, when when uh, uh, physicists, biologists, economists tr- try to understand complex systems better, they model them, mm-hmm. purposefully simplifying to gain better understanding. Yeah. And what models do we have available? Well, there are computational models, of course. There are graphic models. Um, and there are games. Mm-hmm. Role playing and the like, and so, so it was clear to, to 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 me, and and I think I wasn't alone, <laughs> that we could make greater use of all kinds of of models, but including manual tabletop models, games, because games are all about examining what are the a- interactions of actors and factors in a simplified, simulated setting, including real world settings like modern political systems or past wars. Right. The the modern political systems reminds me that I seem to recall, and I, and I think you've mentioned this publicly, so uh, you know, tell me if you can't talk about it, but I think this <laughs> is one you can, that you know, the, it's, it's really hard for political analysis in particular, um, as opposed to some, you know, to determine military capabilities and play those out, right? Or do some historical things. But to, to game a political system with all of its complexity, at least to me, seems really hard. And yet you found a way to do it, to, to create a model for, I believe it was parliamentary systems to help yes. people understand how, how parliamentary coalitions form and break apart and form again for people who are more familiar with uh, a United States system, for example. Talk, talk through that if you can, some of the details about that game that you designed um, when you were in government and, and what it, what it helped people to understand. Yeah. Um, uh, that game is, it was called coalition and it was co-designed with a, uh, a senior political analyst, um, for a course and, um, uh, a colleague instructor and I were, uh, uh, enabled to actually travel with that game in its early design out to a war game convention to test it out, just on, you know, not on analysts, just on, on players, right? And it was fantastic because the purpose of the game was for analysts who had not grown up in a parliamentary system, but in the American system, what are some insights as to how parliamentary politics works that's different from what, what, what you know 
uh, what you're familiar with. And we took this uh, this game to this convention and we played it with uh, with American gamers there. But we there was a session where we had three foreigners. It was two from Canada and one from Sweden. And those three players absolutely ran the tables in the game. I mean, they just knew, here's what we have to do. You know, we've got a minority government. We've got to form this new coalition. We'll have the majority. We'll be able to, to, to put in all the po- – you know, they just engineered – we had built in the game this ability to, to, to engineer that if you understood what the interactions were, if you could do the math for this parliamentary system. And that's a part of what the game was trying to convey is here's – how and why coalitions form and break up, you know, was one of the aspects of the the focuses of the game. And these three folks just got it right away and 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 ran ran away with it. So it was a, a nice affirmation that that familiarity, that life familiarity um, with a certain kind of complex system, you know, matters and could play itself out in the game. But here was a really fantastic thing about that experience for me. It was one of Several cases I've had where we teamed up an expert, a deep expert, senior analyst, Mm -hmm. um, who had lived and studied this setting for decades with me, a board game designer, Mm -hmm. right? I didn't know anything about parliamentary politics when I started, right? I I was working with somebody who knew a ton about it. And in that exercise of designing the game, we gained insights. Hmm. So there's one thing about, okay, we've got our our experts model of parliamentary politics. We're going to play this game. It's going to present it to students and we're going to have them gain insights from a model that we built for them. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the main thing. But inevitably, because I've seen it happen many times, the expert himself or herself who then builds that model learns more hmm. that that I would as the board game designer say well okay we have to the game has to resolve everything right if it's a closed system rule set like a board game has there isn't a human being there to say okay wait a minute call an audible right we yeah. want to show a system yeah. and that means we have to define it what are the rules right hmm. and so I'd ask questions like well what if the players do this and sometimes the 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 expert would say huh I don't know. I've never asked myself that before. Let me get back to you. And it was filling in gaps. And the reason that that always happens is because if it's really complexity, what we, how we understand as an expert after decades of study is still a model. It's a mental model. There are yeah. still simplifications and we don't realize them. We don't know mm. what the gaps are in the connective tissue and all these relationships until we have to build something that has to work, right? Mm. It has to... Mm. A, 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 a hobby work uh, game designer that I know who's done you know over fifty published games. He said he always had the sense of when he'd 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 he designed the game and players and if the, and if it worked it would be like the Energizer Bunny it would run across the floor right <laughs> and when you test a game that either happens or it doesn't you know and that's why you play test it. So this classroom game, simplified as it must be, hmm. has to work. It has to work. And when you build something that has to work and that people have to be able to operate, it has to produce plausible, realistic results, you find those gaps in your own expertise. It's really, it's really powerful and, and, and incredible. That's a very different kind of game than what I would say is most of these historical games, right? At least for me, I, I categorize them. There's like the big grand strategy type games. I think your um, labyrinth was kind of like this, you know, the whole worldwide war on terror and risk world conquest. And then there's the, the national or regional level kind of strategic games that get into operational issues. And then you have the real tactical games about, you know, how are you going to take this mountain and you can do things like that, but they're all very military security you know, sometimes battle focused in my experience. What you're talking about here is one that is a purely political game. As far as I know, you did not allow for violence in the parliamentary chamber as part of that game. Although that's a fun wild card to put in there, right? You know, roll the die and one one out of 20, somebody stabs somebody from a opposing party. What do you do then? Um, but it seems to me that this is a little different than the perhaps the average game 
what are some of the other outlier games you've seen? What else, what else have people applied this kind of game construct to that people wouldn't say, oh, it's just another historical campaign or battle, but it's, it's a domain that's a little bit different. And yet there is still some purchase to be gained by applying a gaming mentality to it. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the, there's a parallel development in this regard that is usually exciting parallel, both in the hobby board gaming world and in the intelligence community, <laughs> uh, over the, over the last uh, couple of years. And that mm. is that the topics for these kinds of games are mushrooming, are, are, are blossoming. We played military history games in the hobby world out of, they were military history games out of tradition, right? The human complexity is right, everywhere. Right. There's fascinating politics and economics and, mm -hmm. and social affairs and so forth, right? Everywhere throughout history. Why was it that we happened to play historical simulation board games from the, the 1950s to now that are mainly about war? Well, it's happenstance. It's because the, the hobby kind of grew out of the out of Rand and other supports to Cold War thinking and war gaming going on there. And it happened to start with very popular military historical topics, World War II, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's happenstance. And we stuck along that. And now we are realizing mm -hmm. that board games can be used to explore all kinds of topics. And the, and the same was true in the Kent School as far as what we were teaching was mm -hmm. these are models mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. can use them for military affairs and you can use them for political affairs and you can use them for trade. And we did, right? So yeah. what yeah. are examples of that? There are now hundreds of commercial examples of that. I'll just give you one that happens to be, um, you know, hitting the streets recently and is very popular. It's a game called Votes for Women by Fort Circle Games by Tori Brown. Mm -hmm. And it is in the style of games about the Cold War and to a degree games like Wilderness War, very traditional military topics, but it is about the um, the, the 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 suffrage movement mm -hmm. in the in the United States and the history in the 19th and 20th centuries of how um, women's suffrage uh, came about, and it includes a model of um, ratification of amendments to the Constitution that if you want to experience and play with how that works, play votes for women. Hmm. That is an interesting application that I certainly would not have thought of. Um, have you seen any games that are in a sense meta, um, that they're almost games about games, they're games about how people think instead of applying how people think to a historical scenario? Because I'm thinking, hmm. if you can literally apply this to any complex system, then you could apply this to the complex system of critical thinking itself. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know what that would look like. How <laughs> you could, how you could, but it seems to me that that could be useful because having taught critical thinking, um, some parts of it can be really hard to get your head around. And if there's some model that helps us understand it better and it can be done in a gaming environment, that's a fun area to explore. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one example that it makes me think of, and I don't know if it's exactly bang on about mm -hmm. critical thinking, but just to illustrate. So there's a really interesting game that was a, a winner in a, a game design competition that I that I helped run a couple mm -hmm. of years back. And it's a game called uh, Winye Kause by Allison Collins. And the topic of the game is historians um, trying to figure out what was the purpose of the site Machu Picchu in Peru, the Inca oh. Machu Picchu. Okay. So it's a historical game about historians. Okay. <laughs> so it's slightly meta. Yeah. And in it, you can select one of several theories. And pursue and try to prove your theory <laughs> and advance your career as a histor historian wow. um, by finding the evidence for your theory, which of course you're already probably cringing as an analyst you're, to say, wait a minute. Then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are, you're saying you start with the answer and then you try to prove it to advance your career. Well, yes, yeah. that is what you're doing because that's a way in, in Allison's uh, reading, that's the way it worked. And that includes, by the way, 
you can choose to to try to just advance a theory that is what well, she calls them like a conspiracy theory mm-hmm. to advance mm-hmm. a theory that it has to do with aliens because that's going to advance your career career because it's quite sexy if Machu Picchu actually was an alien culture right. you know and never mind whether you're going to really find the evidence or not so all of that is going on in this game um, uh, you know which is yeah it's it's meta and it explores issues of how critical thinking or poor critical thinking in the mm-hmm. context of careerism affected our actual understanding of this archaeological site. That is a it's fascinating a example. I'd not, I'd not heard of that one, but it seems to me you could apply that to all kinds of issues. Um, yeah. You could have meta in a different way as you could do a flat earth conspiracy game. And of course the board would have to be flat, right? So that just makes <laughs> right. it... You know, rubbing their face in it. Um, one final thought on applying this to the business of, of intelligence that I've always wondered. So many of these games, um, obviously not some we've just talked about, but uh, perhaps some of the more military focused one. Um, if you see a board of a game like this, I think probably the median board uses what I think you call a hex system, mm-hmm. where for movements, um, you can move in these particular directions and you can move so many squares in a given amount of time because that's right. the best representation there is um, for different vehicular movements or, or movements on foot, depending on the time um, or in air or on sea, whatever it happens to be. Um, and yet when I, when I, I won't reveal who it was, but when I said to somebody I've known for a long time that I'd be talking to you about board games and applying them to intelligence and national security issues, the first thing he said was, what's up with all the damn hexes? Like, why can't we have a board like, and I said, like, what, like, what else are you going to do that actually fits and allows you movement in multiple Mm -hmm. directions? He's like, well, you know, risk, you know, you could have a bunch of different borders. Right. I'm like, yes, but remember, like, remember the issue with New Guinea, right? There's only one access point to all of Australia. You still have to make choices about where players are allowed to, to move troops and you can have something like, what is it, Ukraine that has all of these borders around it, or you can mm-hmm. have the territory of uh, New Guinea that had only one access point into Australia um, from, from Asia. You're still making choices about how people can move. But have you faced that from others that there's some people just look at a game board with all of the hexes and they see a bunch of tokens that are really small and hard to read and, <laughs> yes. and all of these boards with 10 points and then this and 17 kinds of, of dice to roll. And they just roll their eyes and say, I, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there, there are two issues in there. Uh, the, 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 se- the second one you just raised is what is the accessibility mm-hmm. of your design? Mm-hmm. Uh, we would think we'd like it to be as accessible as possible and still serve its purpose. Uh, but the first one is uh, a, a narrower, narrower issue of how do we represent the, the, the field of maneuver, the, the environment of our system. Uh, typically in, in war games, it's a map. And how do we regulate movement? And hexes are only one way and to sort of to explain the purpose of, of hexes and then what the alternatives are very quickly. If you think about a chessboard, um, the squares on a chessboard that regulate movement are a simplification. Mm-hmm. If you think chess of, as being some kind of representation of medieval warfare, maybe, let's, mm-hmm. let's imagine mm-hmm. that way, you're moving pieces across a field of battle and really a horse can ride in any direction and for several speeds and can stop at any one point. And you're here simplifying that for gameplay purpose. Yep. So that you don't have to measure out, you know, and assess angles and that sort of thing. You're you're do, you're simplifying that into a grid of squares. Hexes do the same thing. They do it slightly more realistically because it's the closest we can get in a grid to circles. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, but that is only necessary and is only the best solution if we really care about things like rates of movement and terrain. Uh, It may be very important for our simulation, depending on the topic, a tactical game like Combat Commander, right? that movement is realistic. Time and space matters. How fast that horse rides or how that tank drives matters to the system. Uh, 
to the outcomes. But it may not be. So in my game about the war on terror, Labyrinth, it would be silly to use a hex map of the world. Why, why would I do that? Time and space are not the key points here. Aspects that are key are mm. what are diplomatic relations and economic yeah. aid and, and our troops deployed in Saudi Arabia or Iraq, things like that. Speed over terrain isn't really point. So for that, it's a point to point map. It's a grid, but it's much simplified and certain countries connect to other countries. And that's all you need to know, which country is this piece in. And similarly, like risk, uh, a lot of my designs use what's called area movement. So you mentioned my game about Colombia and about Vietnam and the coin series. Those games are area movement games. It doesn't really matter how fast guerrillas or police go from this part of the country to that part of the country, because what we're really representing is recruiting and training in localities. And these pieces kind of live in those localities. What's important is how much police, uh, how many police are there in uh, Huila province and how many guerrillas are there of which factions. So we're just putting pieces into areas. They might move from one area to another, but it, again, a hex map is not the solution. So this is the, the key point to that is these are all tools. <laughs> Apply the ones that yeah. serve your purposeful simplification. Accessibility, um, again, it, 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 it comes down to the, what you're looking for and what the purpose is. Mm. If I want to appeal to a broad audience, I probably shouldn't start with a design that's going to require thousands of pieces and giant hex maps that take a ping pong table to lay out. There yeah. are enthusiasts for those kinds of games and yeah. those kinds of games do their thing very well. But if my purpose is, you know, I want to have a, 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 a large audience that is perhaps only casually interested in history, mm -hmm. uh, experience and gain insight from the historical hunt for Blackbeard the Pirate, I'm probably going to give you a small board with mm -hmm. a few spaces that connect in a carefully engineered way to mm -hmm. reproduce that historical episode. How far are we away from the Blackbeard game? And this is an opportunity to talk about how <laughs> game design is done and the uh, pre-sales matter. So talk through that process a little bit so people understand the timeline of gaming. Sure. Uh, uh, I have a saying that nothing fast happens in board games. Um, yeah. it, the, so Hunt for Blackbeard has been in work for many years and uh, typically done right. Uh, game design goes through months to years of testing and development to refine it and make it better and make it better. And so I, I think this design has, has benefited from that. And you get to a certain point where you, you find you're not making very many changes anymore that you've taken away everything you can take away without diminishing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's ready for art. And then if you have a publisher uh, who feels that uh, there'll be payoff on the really expensive part of it, which is not you, the designer, mm. or the play test or the development, the expensive part of it is physically producing the product, mm. uh, then, then uh, artists or artists are hired typically, uh, do the finished art and you get the files that enable a physical production to happen, mm -hmm. often in China, um, and and it goes to market. So Hunt for Blackbeard is, is at that point where we have recently begun art, mm -hmm. and um, any actual changes to design are tiny at this point, and I'm simply preparing background materials and interacting with the artist and publisher, the producer, mm -hmm. to make the finished thing uh, uh, become available and I think the idea is to have a Kickstarter uh, for the game sometime between November and January. And so mm -hmm. my hope is we see the actual product hit the street in 2024 sometime. Okay. My, my memory tells me there used to be, and maybe there still is, something magic about the number 500 when it comes to orders for a game <laughs> and getting it made. How does that work? So that's a reference to GMT Games. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the the publisher that I have most um, published my games by um, uh, heretofore, GMT Games in California. And they had a system they came up with in the 90s to basically regulate their cash flow, test market demand, and survive mm -hmm. as a war game publisher because yeah. it's difficult. And that is they ask players to commit a pre-order. The player who's interested doesn't pay anything, just says, yeah, when you print this game, should you print this game, I'll, I'll take it. 
And for commit making that commitment, there's a discount. So it's a yeah. discounted price. And 500 was the number in the 1990s that was the break-even point. That if they got 500 pre-orders, uh, give or take, mm-hmm. they could print the thing and not lose money, <laughs> right? And and so that was the number. That number is now higher, uh, but it's still called P500 for that reason, Project 500. And it lets them test the market and also print, not risk-free, but with a diminished risk mm-hmm. of having something sitting on their shelves that they paid for that that no one is buying and is just taking up warehouse space because they've gotten a gauge yep. from these pre-orders from their usual uh, market, uh, how many they might sell once the thing is printed. And it must suck as a designer. I don't know if you've ever been in this position, but it must suck as a designer to have something in that phase and you're just short, right? And all your friends and colleagues and people <laughs> who are interested have said, yes, I've pre-ordered, but they're, the publisher's telling you we're not quite at that mark yet and you're yeah. just in the waiting game. Yeah. And it is nowadays with, again, uh, this is a part of the social media collaboration, uh, if you will, the designer's involved in marketing, mm-hmm. right? To get the thing done. And the designer should be involved in supporting the product afterwards, helping players learn, providing background materials. Uh, mm-hmm. I make videos about about my games, um, uh, answering questions, uh, improving the, if there's something that needs to be improved and and so forth. Um, it, it's, it, it, it's all, um, interactive. It's mm-hmm. all interactive now, but I will tell you, um, that happened to me with hunt for Blackbeard that it oh. was, it was with GMT and it was not doing well with pre-orders, um, for a variety of reasons, but, but it gave me the opportunity to take another look at the design mm-hmm. and it's a much better game now. I mean, the gar- mm-hmm. in a way the market was right to reject it then, because what we're going to have now is, is a design that I'm, I'm substantially prouder of. So that's an important note for us all all to have, which is you can't just create a bad game about pirates and hope that because it has <laughs> yeah. to do with pirates, that people right. are going to buy it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that was my thing. Everything is better with pirates. You know, what could go wrong? Um, but uh, but no, that's not that's not the case. The, the, the market is discerning. But another, um, as, another saying I have in this regard is a, uh, about board games and war games. It's not my own saying, but another um, designer is uh, that, that board games are are never finished, only published. Hmm. And so once it goes out, that, you know, you want to see how people are reacting to it. You want to see players playing the game Mm -hmm. and you want to take what you learn then to the degree that you can and refine the product uh, and support the experience. You know, it's, we, we know with models, testing is a big hurdle testing and refining and calibrating that model to do its thing. Mm-hmm. If you're doing that with a computer, it's, it's, you know, you can iterate very quickly. If it's a board game, you know, it's very, very hard to, to test thoroughly, right? Every experiment you're changing it. And now you need a, a new experiment and yeah. you, you know, you only have the dedicated volunteer labor of enthusiasts to do that. So you might have, mm-hmm. I mean, if, if a, a board war game had a dozen different people play test it. That's lucky. You know, that's yeah. a lot. And then it goes out there. And, and if you're successful, hundreds and maybe even thousands of people play it, you're going to learn a lot no about kidding. how the thing yeah. works and, and could work better. Let me ask you one other substantive question. Uh, looking at current events, uh, what, what thing happening in the world now do you think would be a really fun game. You know, I immediately go to the issue of this Ukrainian counteroffensive this spring because it builds in a lot of classic issues of, you know, strength and weaknesses of lines, um, deception and camouflage. It brings in issues of resources and availability of ammunition. Like all kinds of issues could go into a good game design all along the front within Ukraine and perhaps even into Russia too. But that's just the top of the headlines thing. What else is going on in the world that you think would be a really fun game? Anything from, you know, the space race to issues having to do with cyber and misinformation? Um, what occurs to you? Yeah. And um, uh, by the way, there is already from a, a, a famous designer and another well-known um, personality of the hobby, a game on the current Ukraine war underway. I think Love their it. first volume has to do with the initial dash for 
Keith in uh, 2022. Yeah, quite, quite fast. Um, I, I hope this isn't a cop out, but I have to say almost everything. <laughs> uh, because once you once you start looking at the world in, as, as as these complex systems that we talked about, you see them everywhere, right? And mm-hmm. once you see them everywhere, you start thinking about, well, how could we model that? Human interaction, I mean, especially mass human interaction, but human interaction is all a matter of um, competing, but also overlapping interests and agendas. And those are victory conditions in games, right? And everybody goes about um, pursuing those by some ways, and those are game mechanics, and with some means, and those are game pieces and resources and the like. And I, I have to say, I see almost everything that way. It's hard to you know, name something and, and we can talk about a game uh, that, would, that would be interesting and illuminating um, to, uh, and it can, be, it can be elections. There are absolutely already games about cyber warfare, uh, in, influence operations and the impact mm-hmm. of malign influence actors. There are games about that yeah. um, out there, uh, in, including by uh, uh, Sebastian's uh, group at, at Georgetown that, that you had mentioned. Um, if, it's, if it's humanity, <laughs> Okay, if it's an aspect of humanity, um, you can gain by gaming it yeah. in understanding. You can gain understanding by gaming it. That's my assertion. Okay. Let me move to our chatter box where Uh-oh. I will pull out a random question and I'm ask so bad you at these. to give us your wisdom. Folko, name one dead political or national security related leader from any era that we could really use right now. Right. Well, I think impactful, uh, I think of Caesar, Mm. uh, and he could be helpful, could also be harmful. That'd be a a risk. That'd be a a a risky choice, right? But what I think of, if, if to the degree to which we take his, you know, self portrayals, um, as, as reasonable, if Mm. not, you know, Mm -hmm. if not uh, fully, fully truthful, um, he, I thought, very amazingly combined uh, military, diplomatic, and political talent mm-hmm. in one national security leader. Mm-hmm. And especially when I when, when I read the the, the the Gallic Wars, what he seems most most proud of, and we try to bring out in the game Falling Sky that that you mentioned, um, is his diplomacy and how he was able to go into this foreign land, this foreign culture that was incredibly complex, <laughs> uh, and, uh, learn about it and manage it all. There's a lot of, in that, in his, in his memoir about how he's meeting delegations and he's solving problems among tribes and so forth. And, and, and it seems to me as, as, at least as proud of that as he is the fact that his legions could defeat the enemy in battle. And then of course we know, um, how he was able to um, manage the political system back home in mm-hmm. the context of this this foreign war. So, mm-hmm. you know, if we had now, here's the big if: as a force for good, if we <laughs> yes. had as a force for good mm-hmm. that kind of talent, I could see how we could um, reach national security solutions that you know seem intractable to us now. Well, that makes sense, right? Uh, what 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 constraints do you put on it that don't diminish the benefit you get from that political, you know, strategic diplomatic acumen? Um, good answer. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you spending this much time with us, uh, Volko. I'm very grateful you came on Chatter today. Well, wonderful talking. Of course, as you know, this is a topic I can go on for quite some time. <laughs> Thank you. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. 